introduce, you can introduce yourself. Excellent. Thank you very much, Martha, and uh, to everybody who's arranged this event, um, and to everybody for uh, giving up your time to join us today for what should be a very interesting session. Um, the way we sort of structured it is that after we introduce ourselves, I would present a few slides about the purpose, really, of why, why conduct a systematic or a scoping review. Um, and then Jericho would continue on um, and provide a bit of further information just to revise uh, some of the key principles which you've learned over the past couple of weeks. So because of that order, I think it's probably best if Jericho, perhaps you introduce yourself first and then I'll introduce myself and then start with the slides. <laughs> no worries, Rhys. I know you're going to say that one, so I'm already well prepared for that. <laughs> um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, dan Salam Kebajikan uh, untuk kita semuanya. Uh, greeting from Brisbane. Uh, my name is Jericho Pardosi. Uh, if there's any uh, Batak people, I will say Horas. <laughs> It's been a while, never say Horas in, in Brisbane. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm currently one of the academic staff here at the School of Public Health and Social Work at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. I convene research method for postgraduate level uh, for health management students, for uh, public health, as well as the occupational and health uh, safety students. And uh, my research focus heavily uh, interested in reproductive maternal and child health. Anything about women's, pregnant women, children health, uh, happy to discuss further with you. That's just my introduction, Reese. Give it back to you. Excellent. Sounds good. Um, and sorry if occasionally the um, uh, the shade of my video changes. It's because uh, it's not only very hot over in Indonesia. Uh, it's very hot here in Brisbane today. So occasionally I have to pull down the the blinds to ensure that I, I don't melt while I'm during the meeting today. Um, so my name's Reese Hinchcliffe. Uh, I'm an associate professor in health services research here at Queensland University of Technology. Uh, my main research interests are uh, how to regulate health systems to ensure that the quality and safety of care provided to populations uh, constantly increases. So what we're striving for is continuous quality improvement. Um, and as part of that, I'm also interested in how we can reconfigure health systems to also support that same goal. Um, as you can see um, that Martha, Martha has kindly shared uh, a little bit about my, um, uh, my background and my CV. Uh, one of the, the main points to note really is that I have conducted a lot of uh, different types of literature reviews, um, including systematic and scoping and rapid reviews. Um, I've published, I think, nine journal papers and a couple of reports based on literature review projects, um, and I have several underway at the moment. So because of that, I, I like to think that I have a reasonable level of expertise uh, regarding this, this issue of how to conduct a literature review. And I look forward to, uh, to sharing that and my experience with you um, throughout the session today. Um, so with that, Martha, um, perhaps I can share my screen and I'll just bring up some initial slides. If someone can confirm once the slide deck appears on your screen, Yes, you can see it. Yes. yes. Okay. So what we'll do, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'll probably just spend maybe you know five to seven minutes really trying to talk through why would you conduct a systematic uh, or other type of structured literature review in the first place. Um, and then also share some advice about why it's important to actually partner with industry uh, or community or government groups to design um, literature review projects. And of course, I would like to thank my good friends at UNDIP, uh, who I've visited uh, many times now um, in your beautiful city, um, and in particular, Martha, who's a, a great friend of not just um, Jericho and mine, but um, also QUT. Um, and we've had many good times, both in Brisbane uh, and also in Samarang. As we always do um, with our presentations in Australia, uh, we'd like to begin, even though it's a, uh, a remote presentation, we always still begin with acknowledgement of traditional owners 
because we're Jericho and I are delivering this presentation um, from Brisbane. So the Queensland University of Technology acknowledges the Tuabal and Yugara as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands. We pay our respect to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits. We recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. And QUT acknowledges the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QUT community. Now, to start with, you might wonder, okay, so why would I conduct a systematic review? Why wouldn't I just go ahead and try to do some original, let's say public health research uh, in a local community um, in central Java or elsewhere within Indonesia? Well, it's because as we know throughout history um, and even up until this day, there are many examples of non-evidence-based health policy and practice. Now I'm sure you can think of many off the top of your head already, but I've just listed a few here. So if we look back all the way back to 1497, uh, Vasco da Gama, uh, one of the early European uh, naval explorers, discovered the power of citrus, okay, and understood that citrus actually prevents scurvy. However, even though it was discovered at that time, scurvy actually continued killing people all the way up until 1932. So that means around 2 million uh, largely European sailors actually died of scurvy unnecessarily during that time period. Smoking is uh, perhaps a much more contemporarily relevant uh, example. So the first report on the health impacts of smoking was published in 1964. And as we know, around 50% of all smokers actually died from a smoking related disease. Um, these next statistics are already slightly outdated. Um, but tobacco, I think this was in 2019, um, continued to kill more than 8 million people a year, with 80% of these fatalities occurring in low and middle income countries. Um, I've also noted that they're vaping, uh, which is a good example of an area where there's a new intervention that's introduced into society uh, without really knowing yet the, what the weight of evidence indicates in terms of its safety. We can also see this in relation to drugs, medications. So thalidomide, which you may be aware of, became available in 1957 to alleviate morning sickness amongst pregnant women. So within 10 years, 14 multinational pharmaceutical companies had marketed um, and sold it in over 46 countries. Now this it was quite quickly that uh, the community, um, policymakers, industry actually realized this drug was leading to malformation of the limbs of children. Um, and there was only a 40% survival rate for those children. You can see it only took four years. So in 1961, the adverse effects were noticed, but it continued to be sold in a lot of countries until 1980 with approximately 100,000 victims. So again, you can see that throughout time um, and throughout different elements of healthcare, um, there's been a real barrier between understanding the research and then ensuring that that informs policy and practice. Um, before we continue to that slide, I thought I should uh, also just mention, uh, considering the situation we find ourselves this year with COVID-19, um, we know that there were very early indications that, uh, that it was spread by aerosol. Um, however, there was large opposition to the wearing of face masks um, amongst the community um, in many countries around the world, including Australia. Um, so this would be another very relevant uh, example where the evidence regarding an issue hasn't directly informed policy. Um, and for, these are the types of reasons that it's important for academics like us to be able to use a structured systematic approach to reviewing evidence on a particular issue or a particular intervention, pull all that together and then communicate that to key stakeholders, including government in an effective way to ensure it changes policy and practice to help improve population health. So that's a bit of a background on sort of the rationale for systematic and scoping and other types of reviews. But before we move on and I hand over to Jericho, I'd just like to also mention that 
we quite often as academics, uh, how does the metaphor go? We can sit in our ivory towers, meaning very separate from the real world issues and problems faced by other members of our society. So for this reason, I believe whether it's other types of original research or systematic reviews, it's important to really focus on ensuring that it has practical applications. And these are some steps that I've found from my career um, and that are also reported uh, by other academics in the literature. So it's important to collaboratively determine the most important problems to address. The challenges that we face in public health are almost infinite. Um, however, our time and our resources as academics are finite. So therefore, we have to have a prioritization of what particular issues we intend to examine through systematic reviews. The best way to do that and to prioritize what we're going to spend our time on is actually to collaborate with the end users, the people who are going to be affected by the results of our research. So that could be, yes, community members, but could also be uh, local uh, health um, stakeholders, um, national health stakeholders, non-government organizations, and other industry groups. So even if you're conducting a fairly small scale systematic review, I would highly encourage you to first of all discuss it with different types of stakeholders to ensure that it's going to produce findings that are practically relevant. The next step is to examine the relevant evidence via systematic reviews. And then you can see there are various other steps that can flow on from that. So it's important to collaboratively determine the most important problems, conduct the systematic review, then that can feed into further um, attempts to bridge knowledge gaps. Um, and then you can publicize those findings to actually influence change. As you can see here, I believe the researcher's role um, is to facilitate evidence-informed, but not necessarily evidence-based policy and practice. So why am I raising that in the context of a presentation about systematic reviews? Well, it's very rare that evidence from research by itself should actually dictate health policy and practice. No matter how um, strong the findings are, to support any intervention or policy or practice. We need to keep in mind that um, there are financial implications, there are political implications, um, and there's an opportunity cost as well in pursuing any particular action within healthcare uh, because the time we spend on that could have been spent on something else. So I would encourage you when you're developing and writing your systematic reviews and publishing it, to always be very judicious and careful with the phrasing that you use, particularly in regards to recommendations for change based on your findings. So we need to co-produce high quality research evidence, then enable its impact via effective dissemination and advocacy. Um, and time permitting later on in this presentation, I'd be happy to speak to those points. And it's important to foster ongoing successful collaboration with different types of stakeholders so for you at UNDIP, obviously Central Java um, would be, you know, your key sort of health stakeholders there, but also clearly the, the national stakeholders as well. Now, I don't want to take too much of our time today um, away from the Q&A regarding systematic reviews, but I thought I'd just conclude with this slide. Um, and I'm happy, uh, Martha, to be, to, for these slides to be shared um, and happy to take any further questions by email in the future as well. But essentially what I'm trying to, rather than focusing on the details of this slide, what I'm trying to uh, uh, reinforce really is my belief that even with systematic reviews, it's important to conduct them collaboratively with other stakeholders outside of academia. So my final advice for you thinking of, okay, how am I going to produce and then most importantly report the findings from my systematic review? I'd like you to consider these principles. So research should always be designed and implemented by thinking of the practical needs of end users. So your healthcare professionals, policymakers, and the community. And it's important to present your findings to these stakeholders using different techniques. So rather than just saying uh, one drug had a 10% uh, uh, better chance of reducing uh, 
any type of infection than the next drug, it's better to actually also use not just those statistics, but where possible anecdotes, um, try to collaborate with, um, with other people who, who want to make similar changes to the system, look at cost benefit or cost effectiveness analyses, um, and then try to think about how you can prepare to deliver and communicate your findings to different audiences to suit their particular interests and needs as well. So that will conclude the first part of um, the presentation. So I might stop sharing my screen now and Jericho, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you so much, Rhys. Okay, let me share my screen now. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. So yeah, um, just want to continue. Um, I want, yeah. firstly, I want to thank uh, Professor Ari who has provided adequate details about how to conduct systematic review. Uh, I think Professor Ari already explained clearly the difference of different types of review. Uh, just a reminder for you know, uh, my, I mean, my colleagues who wanted to do a review, whether it's a systematic review, a scoping or a rapid review, you need to ask this question again. What has been done? about your chosen topic, perhaps your topic focusing more on uh, leprosy or other specific public health issues. What methodologies have previous scholars or researchers used, including what will be the theoretical framework, what will be the relevant theoretical framework and models that you can utilize in your systematic review? Excuse me, Pat Jericho, you can also uh, say in, in Indonesia? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm happy to yeah. present it yeah. in, uh, in Bahasa if you want. Yes, please. Oh, okay. So make it more clear to everyone. Yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. Riz, apologize for using Bahasa. Yeah, sorry for you, Riz. <laughs> uh, so yeah, jadi uh, ketika mau melakukan systematic review, uh, tidak serta-merta juga bahwa semua topik bisa dijadikan systematic review. Kita perlu uh, mengetahui, bahkan perlu melakukan kayak semacam scoping search dulu untuk tahu sejauh mana metodologi, metodologi yang sudah dilakukan dalam topik yang akan kita lakukan. Misalkan contohnya topiknya tentang uh, kusta, atau tentang malaria, atau sekarang tentang COVID. Karena semua orang tiba-tiba semua uh, melakukan uh, uh, daring research, ya, online research tentang COVID. Tadi seperti yang sudah disampaikan Riz bahwa ini merupakan peluang juga bagaimana melihat gap of knowledge dari topik yang akan kita kaji melalui systematic review. Nah, uh, saya bersyukur bahwa Prof. Ari sudah menjelaskan tentang hierarchy of evidence. Seperti bisa dilihat bahwa systematic review itu uh, berpadanan dengan meta-analisis. Nah, untuk meta-analisis ini uh, tentu saja dibutuhkan Uh, statistik skill yang cukup advance. Jadi uh, saya mengencourage siapapun juga yang uh, sedang mendengarkan saat ini yang sedang berusaha melakukan meta analisis, coba pastikan bahwa uh, ada tim atau anggota member yang uh, punya advance statistik skills karena di sini sangat penting sekali untuk punya anggota tim yang memahami bagaimana menyajikan perbedaan data-data yang ada akhirnya bisa disarikan dalam bentuk uh, forest plot atau mungkin weighted average. Uh, lainnya. Jadi bisa dilihat systematic review itu bahkan di atas randomized control trials karena tujuan daripada systematic review adalah untuk to find high quality of evidence untuk menemukan kualitas evidence yang tinggi dan biasanya tentu saja itu banyak melalui RCTs atau melalui cohort study dan kalau tidak ada mungkin harus turun ke case control bahkan sampai ke laboratory studies. Saya ambil ini dari Bolan, ini 10 step yang Prof. Ari juga sudah menjelaskan detail demi detailnya. Tapi saya hanya mau menyajikan 10 menit ke depan beberapa challenges, key challenges, barriers, or hurdles untuk doing a systematic review. Seperti yang Bapak, Ibu, dan teman-teman lihat, bahwa step satu yang paling penting adalah planning your review. Ini yang seringkali banyak orang-orang atau banyak colleagues yang melewatkan ini saja, langsung saja ke step 2, perform scoping searches. No, you have to go back with planning your review. Planning review-nya seperti apa? 
identify potential collaborators. Tadi Riz sudah menjelaskan, it's very important to work with local stakeholders. Karena at the end of the day, pada akhirnya, yang akan menggunakan hasil-hasil studi kita adalah government agencies. Jadi teman-teman di dinas kesehatan, teman-teman di rumah sakit, mereka nggak punya banyak waktu untuk melakukan primary research. Dan untuk itu juga systematic review akan memudahkan mereka, dalam tanda kutip memudahkan karena kita sudah mensintesize semua evidence-evidence yang ada. Dan juga perlu dilihat bagaimana software yang harus digunakan. Bapak-Ibu mungkin tahu Mendeley. Kalau di QT, we use uh, EndNote. Dan lagi-lagi itu hanya software yang berusaha untuk membantu kita remove duplicate sebagai bagian dari tahapan yang nanti uh, di tahap tiganya. Nah, ini ada 10 tahap. Nah, tahap yang pertama adalah planning your review. Sekali lagi pertanyaan adalah, do you need to write a review? This is an important question. Apakah memang uh, Bapak-Ibu atau teman-teman perlu menulis review? Dan seperti apa structure review-nya? Is it rapid review, scoping review, systematic review? Ada begitu banyak macam-macam daripada uh, structure review. Dan punya nggak expertise di dalam tim? Jadi tidak hanya menulis sendirian. It's very rare for someone to write uh, systematic review sendiri. Karena ada tahapan di mana screening dan eligibility itu perlu dilakukan paling tidak minimal dua orang. You need at least two person to go through all the articles in order to select the included studies. Nah, jumping ke tahapan yang berikutnya, stage 2 adalah developing research questions. Uh, Prof. Ari sudah menjelaskan salah satu framework-nya adalah PICO. P-I-C-O. P-nya patient, populasi, atau problem. Problemnya apa? Kondisi penyakitnya apa yang Bapak Ibu mau kaji lebih jauh? Apakah interest terhadap intervention atau exposure? Dan apakah ingin membandingkan dengan populasi yang sehat atau dengan populasi yang sakit atau populasi yang mungkin mencuci tangan dengan populasi yang tidak mencuci tangan dan outcome-nya seperti apa? Apakah mortality, apakah morbidity, ataukah dalam bentuk komplikasi? Nah, kegunaan daripada research question framework ini adalah it will help you in developing the search term. Jadi akan mengembangkan kata-kata kuncinya itu berdasarkan elemen-elemen dari research question framework -nya. Nah, Pak, bagaimana kalau saya di bidang kualitatif? Apakah ada? Ya, ada. Itu menggunakan dengan PI, co. Jadi, P-nya adalah populasi. I-nya itu apa? Fenomena of interest. Kalau lagi-lagi, kalau bicara tentang kualitatif, kita harus memahami paradigma kualitatif bahwa kita berusaha untuk memahami people experience, people behavior, people perceptions, dan konteksnya apa. Kita tidak membandingkan. Dalam penelitian buat kita, kita sedang membandingkan, tapi konteksnya, specific or distinct characteristics. Sebagai contoh, populasinya caregivers untuk pasien dengan Alzheimer's. Bapak-Ibu tertarik untuk experience-nya. Seperti apa sih experience-nya? Mungkin uh, saya ganti di situ Indonesia. Nah, pertanyaan penelitiannya jadi seperti, what are caregiver experiences in providing home-based care to patients with Alzheimer's disease in Indonesia? Seperti apakah pengalaman para pengasuh, caregiver, yang mengasuh di rumah terhadap pasien-pasien Alzheimer di Indonesia? Framework-framework lain itu ada yang disebutkan seperti SPICE. Kalau Ibu bisa baca, nanti bahannya bisa saya kasih kepada Ibu Marta. Atau SPIDER. Contohnya, What are young couples' experiences of attending antenatal education during COVID in Indonesia? Nah, ini pertanyaan menarik karena belum ada publikasi sejauh ini atau bahkan primary research yang ingin berusaha mengkaji seperti apa sih pengalaman pasangan-pasangan muda dalam hal uh, kepatuhan untuk ANC visitnya selama masa pandemi ini. Yang lainnya adalah eclipse. Contohnya eclipse itu ada expectation, ada client, location, impact, professional, and service. Contoh pertanyaannya dengan eclipse adalah How to prevent road injury experience by young people atau young drivers in Indonesia? Seperti apa? Bagaimana mencegah kecelakaan lalu lintas yang dialami oleh anak-anak muda atau mereka yang baru saja menyetir mobil atau makan motor? Nah, pada tahapan yang kedua juga dipertanyakan apakah butuh protokol? Apakah butuh protokol? Lagi-lagi protokol dibutuhkan sebagai roadmap for your systematic review. Dan kalau 
salah satu websitenya adalah Prospero. Jadi Bapak Ibu bisa ketik saja sambil mendengarkan saya Prospero itu akan muncul. Di situ ada kolom search di mana Bapak Ibu bisa mencari tahu apakah ada similar systematic review. Mungkin settingnya bukan Indonesia, tapi mungkin di negara lain. Nah, kalau ada protokol tersebut bisa diadopsi untuk systematic review yang Bapak Ibu akan uh, lakukan. Jadi, tidak semua harus dimulai dengan dari nol. Itu berguna juga kadang-kadang membantu melihat bagaimana mereka menggunakan kata-kata kuncinya seperti apa, sinonimnya. Bahkan Prof. Ari juga menyebutkan yang namanya medical subject headings atau MESH. Itu juga penting. Bagaimana menggunakan kata-kata dalam uh, uh, kampus kedokteran atau dunia medis yang bisa untuk mencari tahu bukti-bukti lebih lanjutnya. Dan untuk transparansi. Nah, ini beberapa website untuk reg- how to register your protocol. Bisa melalui Campbell, Cochrane, Prospero, itu fokus ke health and social science. Uh, open Science Framework juga bisa yang fokus kepada material standar. Nah, di saat yang sama, kalau sudah mengembangkan pertanyaan penelitian, maka yang berikutnya adalah mengembangkan kriteria inklusi dan eksklusi. Bahkan, teman-teman, uh, mohon izin juga untuk para guru besar dan profesor yang juga ikut mendengarkan, pasti sudah menjelaskan kepada Bapak-Ibu bagaimana pentingnya membuat kriteria inklusi dan eksklusi. Nah, itu juga berlaku untuk systematic review. Ini hanya beberapa aturan dasar, seperti uh, periodenya misalkan dari 2010 sampai 2020. Atau mungkin Bapak-Ibu pengen mengetahui apa yang terjadi uh, tentang pengalaman penderita pusta sebelum SDGs. Berarti sebelum SDGs. Berarti mungkin sebelum dimulai SDGs sampai awalnya SDG, uh, MDGs dimulai. Nah, itu periodenya. Geografinya mungkin bisa pada level, tidak harus nasional, bisa juga pada level distrik, bisa juga pada level provincial. Partisipansinya seperti apa fokusnya? Specific age group atau gender? Study design-nya, apakah systematic review-nya mau melihat, mau membandingkan, mau membandingkan association atau relationship, maka tentu saja lebih kepada kuantitatif metodologi. Kalau ingin tahu pengalaman, ingin tahu persepsi, maka study design-nya akan lebih banyak fokus kepada penelitian-penelitian kualitatif. Entah itu grounded theory, atau ethnographies, atau uh, case studies, atau narratives. Dan publication type-nya juga bisa. Dalam systematic review, Bapak, Ibu, dan teman-teman juga harus memikirkan apakah saya hanya mau primary research papers, atau apakah saya juga masukkan mungkin editorial comments, atau uh, grey literature. Misalkan laporan-laporan dari dinas kesehatan, atau laporan-laporan dari NGO, apakah perlu dimasukkan. Dan bahasanya juga. Nah, ini hanya uh, four things for better searching. Um, saya akan lewatkan ini. Ini uh, bagaimana kalau menggunakan N itu akan lebih sedikit, kalau OR itu lebih besar, dan menggunakan truncation itu maka akan ada pecahan-pecahannya. Seperti yang ditunjukkan di sini, teen, ada teens, teenage, teenager, and teenagers. Atau phrase. Kalau menggunakan phrase, itu akan mengunci bahwa kita menyuruh database, misalkan PubMed, atau Medline, atau Sinal, to find the exact phrase in the database. Nah, lompat ke tahap screening. Jadi bayangkan sudah melakukan screening, sudah melakukan search di berbagai macam databases dan kalau Bapak Ibu pakai Mendeley mungkin ada uh, proses sendiri, kalau EndNote juga bisa mengembangkan sendiri bagaimana memasukkan semua mengekspor search findings itu kemasukan kepada EndNote dan kita mulai screening. Nah, sebelum tahap screening yang perlu dilakukan adalah Removing duplicates. Removing duplicate itu bisa dilakukan oleh software tersebut. Setelah removing duplicates, maka masuk dalam tahap screening, yaitu hanya membaca abstrak dan judulnya saja. Tidak perlu membaca full teksnya. Dan direfleksikan dengan the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Seperti contoh di sini, 4.081, lalu di remove duplicate ada 435. Ini oleh softwarenya, referencing software. Nah, berarti ada 3.650. Lalu kemudian dilakukan screen. Tidak relevan 3.410. Masih ada 240 untuk melihat title dan abstrak. Dan ketika screening dan abstrak, sambil dicatat, please take notes. What will be your exclusion reason? Excluded mungkin bukan karena gender targetnya, mungkin bukan karena lokasinya. You have to include all the details here. Next, prosesnya adalah eligibility. Nah, eligibility-nya ini tentu saja harus membaca full text. Nah, di sini yang 
uh, cukup memakan waktu bahkan di screening pun cukup memakan waktu uh, at the moment uh, is also writing another uh, systematic review I'm also writing a systematic review uh, try to understand a uh, women's and health volunteers experience with maternal and child health in Indonesia jadi saya sedang menulis systematic review yang berusaha untuk melihat seperti apa sih pengalamannya ibu-ibu dan kader kesehatan terhadap kualitas layanan KIA yang ada di Indonesia. Nah, eligibility-nya ini harus dibaca berdasarkan inklusi dan eksklusi tadi. Dan pada akhirnya, kita dapat yang namanya included studies. Ini contohnya, saya cepat saja. Lalu kalau sudah selesai eligibility-nya, ada data extraction. Nah, gunanya data extraction ini adalah untuk memudahkan nanti ketika masuk dalam tahap sintesis. Data extraction itu apa? Data extraction itu bagaimana kita menghubungkan lagi tadi framework-nya. Misalkan PICO, populasinya, interventionnya, uh, comparison dan outcomes-nya. Nah, itu masuk dalam data extraction. Itu dalam bentuk Excel. Uh, saya aware bahwa Prof. Ari juga sudah menyediakan contohnya. Misalkan uh, year of publication, authors, uh, study design, sampling. Nah, yang perlu dimasukkan dalam data extraction ini adalah informasi-informasi yang relevan untuk to help you in answering your research questions. Karena nanti akan di-report di bagian result sections. Nah, ini contohnya, beberapa contohnya saja, nanti Bapak-Ibu dan teman-teman bisa baca. Nah, karena berhubungan dengan systematic review, tentu saja untuk to find high level of uh, evidence, kita juga harus melakukan appraisal atau quality assessment. Nah, quality assessment ini, uh, ini gunanya adalah untuk meminimalkan bias dan error. Karena tentu saja ada bias dan error ketika melakukan systematic review. Bahkan, bias dan error di dalam included study, studi-studi yang terakhir yang dari 7.000 dan akhirnya mungkin tinggal 20 atau tinggal 30. Nah, saya juga perlu memberitahukan bahwa dalam systematic review jangan ada anggapan bahwa oh minimal harus 10. Itu final studies-nya. Tidak juga Bapak Ibu. Itu tergantung bagaimana search strategy, bagaimana search terms dan bagaimana inclusion and exclusion criteria-nya di-apply. Ada beberapa systematic review yang bahkan sampai 50 studi. Ada beberapa systematic review yang hanya menggunakan, bahkan hanya menggunakan lima studi saja. Tetapi itu memang kembali lagi kepada the research questions. Ini link-link untuk melakukan quality appraisals, baik untuk yang kuantitatif maupun juga untuk kualitatif. Nah, untuk grey literatur bagaimana Pak? Laporan Dinas Kesehatan, bagaimana kita bisa meng nya Itu ada dengan menggunakan double A codes, checklist. Ini tambahan critical episode tools. Ini contohnya. Jadi ini semua included studies. Dan ini kriterianya. Bapak-Ibu bisa bilang weak, moderate, atau strong. Ini untuk qualitative result. Saya hanya constrain waktu. Untuk analisisnya. Analisis dan sintesisnya. This is the opportunity untuk Bapak-Ibu mengidentifikasi pattern. Pasti ada pattern-patternnya dari 10 atau 20 included studies. Tematematiknya seperti apa, relationship-nya seperti apa, terus direction findings-nya, dan bagaimana mengintegrasikan berbagai macam studi yang berbeda ini, dan akhirnya terlihat benang merahnya. Makanya biasanya kalau Bapak-Ibu baca systematic review, mereka akan memulai dengan studi karakteristik. Contohnya misalkan 5 dari 12 studi itu menggunakan cross-sectional, sementara 4 dari 12 studi menggunakan pendekatan kualitatif, atau bisa juga fokus dengan Bagaimana metodologinya, bagaimana cara pengumpulan datanya, dan lalu mulai melihat key findings-nya. Lagi-lagi dalam tahap analisis dan sintesis ini, ini sangat penting karena tidak semua data harus dimasukkan, hanya yang relevan terhadap framework tadi yang PICO dan juga research questions. Nah, kalau sudah selesai, jangan lupa mencantumkan checklist-nya, title-nya seperti apa, di halaman berapa, abstraknya ada enggak, introduction-nya rasionalnya seperti apa. Ini agak kecil, tapi kalau Bapak-Ibu bisa lihat di laptop akan kelihatan. Ini harus diisi. Nah, kalau apalagi khususnya kalau Bapak-Ibu mau publikasi di eh, peer review journal. Editornya pasti akan meminta ini. Itu yang pertama. Dan dia juga meminta apakah Bapak-Ibu sudah meregistrasi protokol sistematik reviewnya. Melalui Prospero atau mungkin melalui platform-platform lainnya. Nah, eh, tiga menit lagi. Bu Marta, ini key point ketika menulis protokol, review protokol, ataupun sedang menulis reviewnya juga. Pastikan academic styles, bagaimana dengan referensinya harus 
konsisten uh, menggunakan ATA, menggunakan MLA atau menggunakan Vancouver dan juga menjelaskan secara eksplisit statement dari inclusion dan exclusion. Jadi tidak hanya pakai dot point tapi juga jelaskan secara eksplisit. Key point lainnya juga uh, baik berupa dissertation ataupun melalui uh, laporan proyek perlu men- memberikan informasi yang cukup jelas, komprehensif tentang bagaimana Bapak Ibu akan melakukan search strateginya atau bagaimana Bapak Ibu sudah melakukan search strategi. Kalau review protokol kan belum, jadi bagaimana Bapak Ibu akan how will you plan your search? Itu untuk review protokol. Tapi ketika menulis untuk review, bagaimana proses yang sudah dilakukan. Detail-detailnya seperti apa, dan juga bagaimana melakukan screening proses, bagaimana melakukan eligibility proses, apakah ada konflik antara si A dan si B dalam melakukan pemilihannya. Karena itu hal yang biasa. Dan ketika ada konflik, misalkan antara si A dan si B, si A bilang 20 studi, si B bilang enggak, 22. Nah, ini pentingnya ada orang ketiga untuk menjadi negosiator. Untuk melihat, oh bukan 20 ataupun 22, mungkin 21, atau mungkin bisa saja jadi 19 studi. Dan bagaimana Bapak-Ibu akan melakukan dan memilih studi tersebut. Juga pastikan beberapa, beberapa banyak orang yang terlibat dalam data extraction. Pastikan juga tipe-tipe data yang akan diekstraksi. Dan bagaimana akan mempre- how will you present your narrative synthesis? Untuk tahap quality assessment, Bagaimana Bapak Ibu melakukan proses appraisal-nya seperti apa? Tipe-tipe analisisnya seperti apa? Dan tools-nya, kenapa milih misalkan Joanna Briggs Institute? Kenapa milihnya pakai Equator? Kenapa mungkin pakainya uh, Newcastle? Seperti itu. Jadi Dan bagaimana cara menggunakannya atau bagaimana implementasinya? Ini sekedar checklist saja, key points. Yang biasanya banyak uh, student struggle ketika dalam writing your protocol atau uh, finalizing your review. Terus what kind of outcome data? Seperti apa datanya? Tipe summary statistiknya seperti apa yang akan disajikan? Dan bagaimana mengadjust beberapa variable variable khususnya bagi yang menggunakan pendekatan kuantitatif. Untuk bagian diskusi dan conclusion, seringkali kesulitannya adalah tidak menjawab pertanyaan penelitian. Waktunya hanya sedikit untuk merefleksikan data yang Bapak Ibu temukan dalam included studies. Bahkan tidak yakin akan argumennya sendiri bingung. Nah, terkadang juga You need to lower your tone down atau overconfidence dengan findings. Kita harus perlu benar-benar uh, mempresentasikannya secara komprehensif. Dan lack of critical appraisal, apakah kita sudah mengikuti critical appraisal? Nah, saya lupa tadi menyebutkan bahwa in doing the quality assessment, you have to read the guidelines. Setiap guidelines itu punya additional explanation. Misalkan uh, tentang methods. Apa yang harus kita lihat, apa yang harus kita periksa. Nah, Bapak-Ibu harus baca uh, setiap uh, penjelasan daripada critical appraisal tersebut. Untuk disseminating publication, uh, target jurnal seperti apa? Uh, apakah jurnal yang Q1, Q2, jurnal bisnis yang uh, authorship-nya seperti apa? Penulis kedua dan penulis ketiga atau keempat. Mit, manuskripnya. Dan jangan lupa menyertakan checklist-nya. Dan akhirnya research. Uh, so, Riz and I would like to acknowledge Shudin and also Ibu Wadek. Tadi uh, sambutan. Uh, Ibu Marta sebagai moderator. Dan juga acknowledge uh, Cameron Kasa for providing additional uh, slides. Ini beberapa referensi yang mungkin Bapak Ibu bisa baca nantinya untuk memperkaya lagi dan mempersiapkan diri khususnya bagi teman-teman postgrad yang sedang atau sedang memikirkan uh, melakukan systematic review. Uh, saya hanya mengutip dari King, uh, the scariest moment is always just before you start. Setelah selalu sebelum memulai, tapi setelah Bapak Ibu memulai systematic review itu akan menjadi lebih baik dan lebih baik. Pertanyaannya, apakah Bapak Ibu memiliki keberanian untuk memulai? Demikian, Ibu. Terima kasih sekali, Pak Jericho. Thank you, Riz and Jericho, for your presentations. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, yeah, I just uh, want to uh, make a summary. Uh, jadi, 
uh, saya buat summary in, uh, bahasa Indonesia saja ya. Jadi untuk Anda nanti membuat systematic review itu penting untuk membuat kebijakan ya. Jadi mengapa sih Anda membuat uh, systematic review itu untuk membuat kebijakan. Jadi step-stepnya lalu bagaimana ya uh, planning. Pertama planning your review, siapa yang melakukan ya dengan local stakeholder ya, diikutkan tidak bisa sendiri yang pasti. Ya. Tidak bisa sendiri. Kemudian mau pakai software apa atau apakah memang eh, kita membutuhkan systematic review tersebut. Kemudian developing a research question yang kedua, langkah kedua adalah membuat research question ya tadi eh, baik eh, secara kuantitatif maupun secara kualitatif bisa ya dengan misa, pedoman itu tadi PICO bisa juga untuk bahkan kualitatif juga ada beberapa tadi yang disampaikan ya Eclipse, PICO itu juga bisa dilakukan kemudian membuat kriteria inklusi atau eksklusi kemudian lakukan screening eligibility kemudian data extraction kemudian melakukan quality assessment jangan lupa melakukan quality assessment untuk meminimalkan bias dan error kemudian melakukan analisis dan sintesis dan akhirnya yang terakhir melakukan research uh, writingnya ya baga- ditulis bagaimana proses dilakukan itu ditulis semua uh, dan hasilnya seperti apa ya baik uh, supaya meningkat waktu karena kita harus selesai jam 11 uh, silakan uh, untuk yang mau <tuh> bertanya uh, silakan saja bisa bahasa Indonesia ataupun bahasa Inggris uh, <tuh> silakan yang mau bertanya bisa tunjuk tangan atau mau mau menulis di chat monggo Riz excuse me uh, this is a question and answer section so uh, everyone can ask your question yes please Ibu Rebecca mau bertanya uh, boleh Bu izin bertanya Bu silakan uh, so, Hi Riz how are you uh, hello Pak Jericho, terima kasih buat uh, kuliah singkatnya. Uh, so I do have a one, I, I do have one question. It's regarding the theoretical framework or the conceptual fr- framework. As we can see here, like um, if you are publishing a, a journal, then you are just following those protocols. But um, in the context of creating a thesis or a dissertation, then do we need a special theoretical framework or conceptual framework rather I mean, like outside the PICO or SPICE or uh, the one that you have just mentioned before. Um, so yeah, my question would be, would there be, do we need a special theoretical or conceptual framework? That's one. And the second one would be, if we still need to do that, then uh, is there any specific or certain, like a pattern or where we can just follow that or we can just follow the protocols like Prisma P or whatever. Thanks, Rebecca. And nice to see you again as well. Um, yeah, so very good questions. Um, and excuse me if I potentially didn't interpret them correctly. P- please feel free to just tell me no, Reese. That's not what I was trying to, uh, to ask. If I get it wrong. Um, So the frameworks that were presented are basically checklists and sort of methodological frameworks. Um, Whether you're applying them to produce a journal article or a a thesis, um, a doctorate, or, you know, a government report, you use the same types of checklists, depending on what type of systematic review you're conducting. Um, And Jericho has given an example of a couple of the different frameworks that are available. Now, If you're talking about a conceptual framework, then where I see that having more relevance is really in the way that you synthesize and present the results, okay? So you would conduct the study in the same way using the frameworks Jericho showed, but let's say, um, I can't think of a, a practical example off the top of my head, but if you had a framework that suggested, let's say a program logic model, so there were certain inputs, um, outputs and outcomes, then perhaps the results that you find, um, the way you can thematically group them and analyze them would be according to that program logic model. So I think that both the methodological and the concepts do have to come together to produce a a high quality systematic review. Does that answer your question? Um, Sort of, but uh, 
if I if I may elaborate more on my question, actually, um, like for example, um, before this, before this, um, we are doing our um, study. I mean, like we are doing field studies for our um, thesis in this master programs, and um, different from creating a journal article, which normally like 2,000, 3,000 words, uh, in creating like a thesis art, uh, thesis project is like way much more than that. And we have lots of um, theory and conceptual framework, which is framed on the literature review part. So not on the result part, but um, in this case, if we are doing systematic, systematic review, then um, following a protocol is a must because that that is like the systematic review, how the systematic review works. So my question would be in the literature review part, do we need a special um, conceptual or theoretical framework before we are um, doing those protocols? Just like the just like the other like for example, like if you are doing an observational study or experiment, experimental studies, then you are like synthesizing from this theory and that theory and you make your own conceptual framework or you just adopt certain theoretical framework and you just do it for your research and uh, prove your hypothesis whether it is right or wrong. But um, for systematic review, because now I'm doing a systematic review and I'm really confused in this part because I'm now um, developing my protocols and um, I don't know whether the, can I just use this PICO steps or PICO um, framework to be adopted on my literature review, or should I still need another conceptual framework for my study? Did you get what I mean? Uh, potentially, and I can throw it over to Jericho as well um, to potentially elaborate on, on my second attempt here. Um, so I think that when if you're initially designing a study, it's always important to have some kind of conceptual framework. And that conceptual framework really uh, reduces the boundaries of what it is that you're looking for. Um, and it automatically leads to a certain hypothesis, which is what you then investigate. And then you're investigating it through a systematic review to start off, and then through original research, usually to fill gaps in the knowledge that you found through the systematic review. So overall, I agree that you need a, a conceptual framework to draw upon, um, but for the actual systematic review component, I believe that it's fine to just use PICO um, or those other types of um, frameworks that Jericho noted before. Jericho, did you have anything to add? Yep. Uh... I will probably respond in a different way because uh, I mentioned earlier about you know using that PICO Eclipse or Spider. Again, it, it actually one of the objective for using that framework. Uh, people usually saying framework or key concepts or conceptuals. Uh, it depends on how you look at the, uh, you know that definitions. But let's say let's just use that one as a key concept. That key concepts can help you in developing your search strategy. Instead of, you know, uh, trying from nothing, like you just come up with, okay, my research questions will be uh, what type of antenatal care challenges that will have difficulties in terms of later on translating that research questions for your summarizing uh, sections or for the results sections. Now with that key concepts with PICO, that will help you very much in terms of developing the search terms. So let's say uh, young people as a populations, think about another words of young people, young uh, spouse or something like that. And then that's only for search strategy. Now for summarizing the findings, that framework can be used in terms of presenting your findings. So in presenting your findings, you may wanna explain about what type of populations in that 12, or whatever the final included studies, what type of interventions, if you're using PIC or PICO, what type of comparison and what type of outcomes. Now, going back to your initial questions about theoretical framework, I think Reese clearly already explained the usefulness of your theoretical framework is, is try to direct your research in terms of you heading to uh, 
a good or positive way or negative or probably in between. Now, a good example of this one, let me just share my screen. It's um, one of the publications by Rees. So we have a publication on systematic review focusing on district level impacts of health system decentralizations in Indonesia. And back then, I remember the way we structure the research questions, we are using more kind of the SPICE approach. But as you can see, many of you will be aware of the six, six building blocks in the WHO. So we use the six building blocks or the system building blocks as a way to translate all the findings from the included studies in terms of looking at the service delivery, in terms of looking at health workforce, and then looking at access, coverage, quality, and safety. Hopefully that answer your question, Rebecca. So I know it's a bit kind of, you know, it's not really gray area, but you know, when you say following the protocol, I would say you have to be cautious when you say following the protocol, uh, you have to be clear, what do you mean by following the protocols? Are you following the existing protocol or your own protocol? Okay, can I ask one more thing? So in this, uh, in this thesis context, do we need hypothesis in um, developing our systematic review? Um, I mean, it really depends on the, the nature of the question, but as a general principle for any type of, you know, significant research project, then I think there should be a, um, a hypothesis uh, or a study, a study aim, really. Like, what's the, what's the question that you're seeking to answer? Um, however, and, and I guess you can represent that, as in terms of a hypothesis for a systematic review as well. So um, usually, let's say your question was, um, what does uh, mandatory face mask wearing um, amongst uh, young people in, in primary school reduce COVID-19 um, rates? So then the hypothesis, you could represent that research question is that um, masks uh, amongst young people do reduce um, COVID-19 rates. So I, I think rather than, than presenting it necessarily as a formal hypothesis, it's more just that the actual research question needs to have some, uh, you know, a, an answer that can be produced through. Jericho? No, it's already well said. Uh, I've seen cases where existing publications, they actually start with hypothesis. You know, if, if we can use that a uh, similar statement mentioned by Rhys earlier. You want to see whether the mandatory mass phase uh, among primary school actually translate into a better outcome of COVID-19. Is it more positive or more negative? You, so you can start with your hypothesis as part of your systematic review, especially if you are utilizing quantitative data, because you know in quantitative data, you will be summarizing different statistic measures. And, and most of the time, you see from the existing publications focusing, uh, you know, utilizing that hypothesis, they will start with the p-value, they look at the odd ratio. So you can mention that one and you can synthesize that one in your findings. Now, obviously there will be some surprises because not all included studies will, uh, will support your hypothesis, but uh, I'm a typical person that even if you have negative result of your finding, you can acknowledge that one and then you can tailor and you can discuss what will be the limitations of that study. And this is where the quality assessment criteria or the appraisal tools uh, actually will help you to identify which one of that 12 or 14 included studies is actually considered as strong evidence, which one considered as weak or moderate. Okay, thank you. No worries, Rebecca. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Riz and Jericho for your answers. Uh, Rebecca, I hope this is clear for you and for all. Thank you. And for the next question, uh, there is a question from the chat. Yeah, do we need ethical clearance for systematic review? Yeah, please, Jericho. Uh, thank you, yep. thank you uh, Ibu Munaya. If that's Ibu Munaya, Thank you for the questions. Uh, simple answer, 
No, you don't need ethical clearance for systematic review uh, because you are not collecting uh, primary data, but there's a but there, but you also need to respect the ethical uh, principles in terms of how you report the findings, how will you acknowledge the authors or the original researchers? That will be the potential ethical implication. So again, for systematic review, you don't need to apply any ethical clearance. Yeah. Okay, that's, thank you. That's absolutely correct. Um, but one thing in the, uh, the quality appraisal process, you will probably end up looking at whether the included um, articles or grey literature, actually, whether they receive um, adequate ethical approval. Um, and as Jericho was saying, it's also important when you're presenting your findings to consider the implications, the ethical implications, because maybe your systematic review will be taken up by the, uh, the health minister and then decisions will be made on the basis of it. So you have to consider, you know, what are the, you know, are there implications for equity in terms of policy changes that could be created because of your work? Um, you know, and even, the, yeah, the way you present your findings, you might want to emphasize certain findings to make it more interesting so you get a publication, but then are you actually being authentic um, and moral and presenting the findings um, in a fair way? Okay. Thank you, Riz. So it's clear, yeah, Ibu Muna, yeah? Uh, uh, the, the, the answer is clear. Now the next question is from Bu Chris Wardani. According to your experience doing research use, using a systematic review, what the key success factor to finish your research report using systematic review? And what about the publication? Do you have any suggestion to reach success in publishing the systematic review research? Thank you. Yes, please. I'll give the honor for you, Reese. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll start with the, uh, the second part because it seems as though the question is really about uh, once you've conducted the study, how do you write it in a way to ensure that you get a journal publication? Um, as we know, uh, as academics, uh, it's becoming increasingly important, um, both in Australia and Indonesia, to ensure that we publish many papers each year um, and throughout our career. Now that's important for the reason of actually sharing the outcomes of our work. Uh, we're all public servants uh, in a way. And so therefore the work that we do should be shared widely um, to, to ensure that it can, can make positive changes. Um, but it's also important for our selfishly for our own careers and our career progression to get promotions and those types of things to get grants. So how do we go about writing out systematic reviews to get published? Yep, I would say is, um, let's say you were doing a systematic review like on the type that I mentioned before, let's say mandatory face masks um, to reduce COVID. So the first thing I would do is look at, let's say, you know, 10 of the best journals in the world. And I would have a quick look over the past year to see whether any other systematic reviews on that topic or a fairly similar topic have been published. I would then look to see what are the common elements in how the work is being presented? How do they structure the results carefully? Even, you know, how does the discussion commence? Um, you know, what type of language, how do they use to describe the results? Um, and these types of things. So that automatically then gives you a guideline, a template almost, so that you could use basically that template, but then put in your findings into the different sections there. Um, I would also recommend uh, actually co-authoring with some one of your colleagues who has experience in publishing systematic reviews because they would have already gone through some of the challenges that you'll face. And so we'll understand some of the hints and some of the tricks that you can use to achieve a publication more efficiently. Um, I think the, the other final piece of the puzzle is to be very specific when you're presenting your results. So most health and uh, medical journals, even for systematic reviews, will have a maximum of 4,000 words. So you might have spent a year, maybe a year and a half, doing a systematic review with many people, 
you've got your key findings and you believe all the findings are incredibly important. But what you need to do is just focus on maybe two or three of those findings and spend most of your time really exploring those. And then in the discussion, explaining why they're important for academics and for health stakeholders to know. Jericho? I'll try to answer number one. I guess you already covered the, the second questions. Uh, in terms of key success factor, I would say the priority will be the compositions of your research team. Again, uh, you are not expecting to write everything by yourself. Um, even uh, Reese and I work together with our librarian. They help us in finding uh, the search, uh, in finding all the uh, relevant articles. Our part is more about doing the screening process, eligibility, and synthesizing the findings. So the key success will be the compositions of your research team. And I guess uh, the second one will be in terms of the depth of knowledge of your proposed topics. Do you have what it takes in terms of understanding that uh, proposed topic? And again, as mentioned by Reese. It's always useful to contact other colleagues, even in different countries overseas, because they might be interested to be part of the, uh, your systematic review project. And last, we, it's about maintaining the focus of your systematic review, following that timeline, commitment to follow that timeline. Uh, at the moment, I'm just enjoying uh, screening another 1,000 articles. That's only the stage and screening process. So I still have to enjoy another 1,000 title and abstract. After that one, it's focusing, reading the full text <laughs> of whatever the, you know, the, the rest of the articles coming out from the screening process. Rhys, do you have anything to be added as a key success? Um, yes, so yeah, as Jericho has said, um, it's a long process, depending on the size of your systematic review. Um, so something that I've started trying to do, sometimes with success, sometimes uh, I wouldn't say with failure, but let's say less success is to actually get um, some students um, to, to help. <laughs> you can basically direct them and guide them on the different steps and meet with them maybe once a week, once every two weeks, but then they do a lot of the day-to-day um, the -day hard work. Um, so I think that's the, you need to do one or two yourself um, and then people like Jericho and I still, we usually do one or two a year where we do the hard work ourselves, usually on a topic of particular interest to us. But then we have a variety of students who, um, who end up sort of doing the work for us. <laughs> that sounds terrible, but it helps them as well. We're, we're mentoring and guiding them. <laughs> um, okay. one, one final thing, sorry to interrupt. Um, there is a, uh, a particular software called Rayan. So that's R-A-Y-A-N. And so that's uh, free access software, which allows many people in a systematic review team to allocate, um, let's say 500 um, abstracts and titles each. And you can also then define, let's say for each of them, um, maybe 50 of each person's articles are screened by another person. So you can actually ensure that there is um, similarity and reliability in the screening process. So thank you, Jericho, for sharing um, the website here of Rayan. So I would strongly encourage everyone to um, play around with it. It's quite easy software to use. I was quite scared when someone showed me at first because we are always learning more software and we have, we're busy you know, teaching, learning, doing research, but this is actually quite simple software and extremely helpful for conducting systematic reviews. Yep. Just probably want to add, it's a win-win solution for both the lecturers and students. So uh, I convene a course, uh, Research Methods in Health, and one of the outcome will be involving students in the form of research project. So with their research project, they can write a typical or a specific uh, structure review, scoping review or a systematic review, or they can also do dissertations. Now with the existing students who want to pursue scoping review or systematic review, we usually ask the questions to them, whether do you have any plan to disseminate your findings 
with a specific journals. Obviously, as a academic staff, we we're probably looking at their writing skills, uh, their adequate uh, experience or knowledge about the proposed topic and our own interests. So again, it's a win-win solutions. And I'm not saying just to make it like, oh, it's easy to write systematic review. No, uh, I should admit no. As mentioned by Reese, it's a long process, but anyone who is doing a PhD at the moment or doctorate, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, Masyudi, I know Masyudi is also uh, joining uh, from Europe. Uh, I, I do believe he's enjoying his time probably collating all different informations as one of the chapters for his PhD. Okay. Derek and Rich, thank you very much for your complete answer. Yes. Pak Yudi, do you have any question? Uh, maybe? Bulintang, Bulintang okay. please. Oh, okay. Bulintang, sorry. Yeah, Bulintang, yeah, please, if you have question. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Riz and Mr. Jericho. Um, I have a two questions. Uh, first is when we write a uh, discussion in our manuscript, uh, is it okay to put uh, new references or we just talk only um, our uh, included article in systematic review? Because uh, I see some paper do and others are not. And second question, um, at this time we already have um, 90, uh, 900 articles that already done uh, for selection uh, roughly, uh, but uh, still need more detailed selection to get uh, to get the included ones. Uh, so is it possible to add new uh, selection criteria in the middle or in the during the process or is so should or must be uh, uh, same with the protocol or proposal that we write down in the beginning. Uh, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, both very good questions. Um, how about maybe Jericho, I'll answer the second question and then you answer the, oh, I'll answer the first question. You can answer the second one. We'll keep yeah. sharing. So I was about to answer the second question. <laughs> so I forgot to mention, uh, uh, Balitang, uh, thank you so much. and. Uh, Hoping to see you soon somewhere in Brisbane uh, with your PhD. No pressure with that one. <laughs> so uh, in doing the selections and eligibility, there's also another process identifying relevant sources. It's what we call citation chaining. Now with the citation chaining, this is where you read the full text after you completed the screening articles. So let's say that 900 articles and then uh, uh, you were reading one of two articles and then you look at the references and you think like, oh, this might be a good additional findings or might be good uh, additional you know, sources. You can do that one at any stage prior to finalizing your included studies. And as long as you mention clearly and describe the process in your manuscript or even in your document, then it should be fine. And with citation chaining, another way is to type the author's name. As mentioned by Reese earlier, you can start with you know, top 10 journals or top 10 authors in your respective discipline or field. And then have a look their academic record or publications, whether they probably you know, potentially publish other result that is not included as part of a peer review articles. For citation chaining, it's an interesting process because, as you mentioned, the, the word explains itself, citation, chaining. It's like chaining. So it's trying to connect all different chain until you find what you expect. I hope that answers your second question. So yes, you can do at any stage as long as you have reasonable explanations for doing that. Thank you. And, um, and in regards to your first question about uh, whether you can introduce new citations in the discussion that weren't part of your results of your included articles, um, the answer is yes. And in fact, it's extremely important to do that. So from my perspective, I think the introduction and background section of the journal paper and also the discussion should um, mostly not cite the articles that you include in your results. Um, because otherwise the question could be asked, let's say if you do it in the background 
and then in the discussion, well, then the question could be asked, why did you do the systematic review at all? Because you already had sort of all the key findings. So it's a little bit of a game. So you introduce the problem, the issue, then you provide the results of all the included studies. And then when you synthesize the importance, what's the takeout messages of those included studies? You do that by connecting it to the broader literature regarding that topic. Uh, mungkin saya bantu menjelaskan dalam bahasa Indonesia untuk teman-teman yang bisa uh, memahaminya. Jadi yang disampaikan Riz tadi adalah ketika kita menulis bagian introduction, itu memang tidak wajar kalau nanti yang included studies kita sitasi. Kalau begitu, ngapain juga kan gitu. Apa alasannya kita melakukan systematic review? Alasan kita melakukan systematic review adalah kita mau menemukan bukti-bukti dengan high quality evidence. Nah, lalu bagaimana Pak caranya menemukan sitasi-sitasi yang lain untuk introduction? Lagi-lagi, tergantung bagaimana approach introduction-nya akan direpresentasikan. Cara lainnya juga adalah, uh, biasanya saya juga suggest students, untuk studi-studi yang tidak lolos dalam tahap eligibility, itu bisa dimasukkan nantinya dalam uh, bahan diskusi. Lagi-lagi, uh, diskusi itu kan bagaimana positioning our findings to the broader extents of literature. Seperti yang dijelaskan Riz tadi. Semoga terjawab, Pak Lintang. Ya, Pak. Jelas sekali. Terima kasih. Selamat untuk 900 artikelnya. Ya. <laughs> Selamat. Semoga ini menguat, ya, menyemangati Bu Lintang untuk melanjutkan proses. Ya. Monggo, Pak Yudi. Mungkin ada pertanyaan? Ya, yang dari jauh ini. <laughs> Silakan. Thank you for the, for the time. Hi Riz, hi Jericho. Nice to see you again in this moment. So in the, in the Netherlands, this time it's too early, but I try to wait up early to see you and join this session. I think this is useful and helpful for, for, for me to make some reporting about my systematic practice. But in this time, I'm just wondering about the how the main aspect or interesting thing in the discussion part in our uh, systematic review manuscript. So it can be interesting thing for the journal editor. So my manuscript can be accepted as a, a systematic review article at, this, at that journal. Thank you for your information. Maybe you can give me some clue or hint so I can write about the discussion part in my minus, uh, my systematic review. Thank you. Um, nice to see you as well. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a little while, so it's lovely to see you, even if it's via Zoom. Um, it's really good to, to see you, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so it's a very good question. How do you write your journal publication? and in particular the discussion in a way to make it attractive to the editors of journals, to make it more likely that they will accept your article for publication. Um, I think that most of the time you're going to produce some new finding, okay? That new finding could be something completely new or it could be a confirmation of a pre-existing finding. Um, but in either case, it's going to be a contribution to the literature. So whatever that contribution is, I would highlight it wherever possible. And I would do that um, in the discussion by commencing with the first paragraph. I would say um, the first sentence should summarize what were the aims of the study. So this, the, okay. the aims of this study to, were to investigate whether this intervention worked more than this intervention. And then I would immediately say, um, you know, a, the, the novel finding was that this intervention works more. And then I would explain that, you know, most of the findings in the literature actually are different, making, you know, this may be one of the first studies that has reported this particular finding. So I would really, rather than um, hide the importance of your findings, I think it's important to keep reiterating. So to keep explaining to the reader Um, both in the introduction and background, but then in the discussion and conclusion, why they should be reading your article. So one, one way I sort of try to explain it is, um, um, so the way you should write any article is that you start by telling the reader, tell them what you're going to tell them. 
And then mm. adults in discussion, you tell them what you're wanting to tell them. And then in the final bit of the discussion and conclusion, you repeat why you told them what you told them. So it's basically you're continually reinforcing why this study is important and why your findings should be published. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Maybe sure. Mas Jericho, can you uh, give me some suggestion in Indonesia as well, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Terima kasih Mas Widi. Ini jam berapa ya sekarang di Belanda? Jam 4.52. <laughs> Ya kalau untuk bicara tadi uh, Riz sudah jelaskan tentang diskusi ya, uh, tentu saja kita akan mem memahaminya mulai dari target jurnal. Ketika kita mau mulai memilih target jurnal, pastikan bahwa kita tahu core fokus daripada jurnal tersebut apa. Apakah uh, serupa dengan topik daripada systematic review kita. Kalau udah, oke, okay, things. Maka berikutnya adalah findings-nya. Nah, bagaimana mempresentasikan findings-nya, bisa dalam bentuk tabular, dalam bentuk grafik, dalam bentuk uh, narasi, itu juga bisa. Nah, saya biasanya bilang sama student saya, uh, pick, coba lihat uh, key systematic review in your discipline yang sudah cited perhaps by thousand people or even more than ten thousand, dan mulai melihat bagaimana mereka uh, mempresentasikan findings-nya dan juga diskusinya. Nah, seperti yang tadi dijelaskan, Riz, kebanyakan memulai dengan reminder. Remind the reader what is the aim of your systematic review. That's the first paragraph. Nah, paragraf berikutnya, kalau saya approach-nya, sampai serupa dengan Riz adalah bagaimana saya mulai memberitahu kepada reader saya, ini loh, significant findings. Yang paling signifikan dulu, nanti bagaimana memposisikannya. Nah, seringkali kan kita agak alergi, ah, takut nih, uh, conflicting findings. Tidak. Justru dengan conflicting findings, itu semakin memperkaya contribution kita kepada body of knowledge. Kita berusaha untuk menjauhi, ah, cari yang sama-sama saja. Nah, enggak. Padahal biasanya editor melihat mau membuktikan new evidence atau kontribusi kepada body of knowledge. Nah, paragraf yang berikutnya yang very least significant. Jadi, berdasarkan skala signifikansinya. Sampai akhirnya nanti conclusion-nya adalah jawaban dari pertanyaan penelitian. Karena tadi pentingnya Waris makanya bilang introductions dan discussions itu sama-sama punya satu Uh, suara yang sama, tidak berbeda bukan berarti yang satu alto, yang satu tenor atau yang satu sopran, enggak sama-sama suaranya dan uh, orang bisa melihat bahwa oh ya, pertanyaan penelitian adalah apakah penggunaan masker diwajibkan kepada anak-anak SD itu bisa mempengaruhi misalkan uh, penurunan kasus COVID-19 misalkan seperti itu dan uh, kalau saya cenderung Uh, merekomendasikan kepada Mas Yudi melihat contoh-contoh yang sudah ada dan lihat bagaimana skeleton writing mereka, bagaimana mereka mempresentasikan uh, setiap paragraf-paragraf tersebut. Biasanya saya taruh di sebelah kanannya, saya tulis, oh dia fokus tentang A dan B dan C. Key sentence-nya apa? Seperti itu. Dan itu kita coba berusaha untuk bukan hanya duplikasi, tapi juga berusaha sesuaikan dengan konten kita. Makanya okay. bagian diskusi biasanya nggak banyak-banyak kok Mas Yudi. Tidak yeah. seperti bagian introduction atau apalagi kalau untuk uh, publikasi publikasi biasanya mereka hanya minta maksimum 3000 sampai 4000 kata. Ya, yeah, yeah. yeah. terima kasih Mas Jeriko karena ini sudah tahapan, tahapan menulis manuskrip dan sedang supervisi dengan supervisor saya. Thank you. Thank you Riz. Yeah. Thank you Mas Jeriko. Thank you Dr. Marta. Thank you. Thank you Pak Yudi for the questions. And yeah, how about the other? Is there any more question? For Riz and Jericho, please, uh, you can also have in Indonesian language. Please, who have any more question? Boleh tanya, Bu Marta? Ya, silakan, Bu Yuliani. Ya, mari, Bu Yuliani. Belum di, oh ya, siap, silakan. Hello, Riz dan Mas Jericho. Ya, Bu Marta, uh, yeah. untuk keduanya aja ya. Starting yeah. to write a systematic review sometimes has difficulty due to limited access to journal. What are the tips that need to be done? Ya, yeah. oke. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's all the question. Oke. Okay. Ya. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a really good question, Mbak Yuliani, karena memang that's the usual problem, uh, unfortunately for many uh, academics or even students in Indonesia. Uh, I know we have like uh, Sinta, is it, is it what called Sinta? Uh, yeah, or, Sinta. Or, but Sinta. it's still not like covering the whole databases. Mm-hmm. This is where you need to include other academics overseas who have access. But importantly, it's not just about access, but you have to make sure that they also have a strong interest and a strong track record on your proposed study. If they have a very similar research interest uh, as you suggested, it will be more likely for them to, to be part of that one. Uh, in any case, it won't be them to provide to access. They usually ask you to send out the review protocol and ask the librarian uh, to, to run your search strategy. And after that one, they will send out all the uh, search result using that Rayan, as explained by uh, Rhys. At the moment, I'm also using Rayan. It's also a good way to, to collaborate with people with limited access of databases. Okay. Thank so, you, Mbak Yulian. Semangat. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mbak Jericho. OK. So we can use Brian uh, for connecting to others, yeah, to uh, <laughs> to be. It's getting more popular now, Brian. Yeah. Okay. Because it's free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the information. This is very important in information for us <laughs> to get, uh, yeah, to get connected to the other source of papers. Okay. Is there any more questions? Please. If someone has more question in English or in Indonesian is possible for you. Jericho, yeah. It's very fluent in Indonesian and English, so don't worry. But not in Japanese. <laughs> not yet. Maybe maybe after we start traveling back to uh, to Java a few times, maybe Jericho can learn uh, high Japanese as well. Well, the only thing I know is just saying Namikolo uh, Jerry asal dari Jakarta. Matur no one you have. <laughs> you have. Hmm. Mungkin uh, ibu mungkin mereka juga berusaha untuk mencari tahu pertanyaan karena memang sangat sulit untuk bisa menanyakan kalau belum mencoba. If you haven't tried systematic review, it will be very difficult. So again, uh, I guess my my suggestion at this stage, if you are postgraduate students and your supervisor asks you to consider because of the COVID pandemic situations, consider you to uh, you know, to start a systematic review, try to follow the suggestion steps as mentioned by Prof. Ari, uh, one by one. And as mentioned by Riz, uh, happy if you want to contact both of us, uh, you know, via email, uh, happy to, to provide further suggestions. Okay, yeah. Um... Tadi sudah disampaikan juga ya oleh uh, Pak Jericho. If you still have questions, uh, they they still can answer your questions uh, using email. Ya, yeah. Bapak Ibu silakan bisa juga uh, menyiapkan pertanyaan uh, dalam bentuk email kepada beliau berdua. Beliau bersedia menjawab kalau memang uh, nanti masih ada pertanyaan tentang uh, uh, Systematic review, ya. Yeah. Uh, sekarang waktunya juga habis. Uh, maaf, Bapak Ibu. Uh, se- kalau begitu kita uh, samarikan saja, ya. Tadi ada beberapa. Bu Marta, sebentar, Bu Marta. Mungkin untuk materi PPT-nya bisa di sharing. Would you like to share your PPT materials, uh, both Rich and Jericho? Thank you. Ya, yeah, Ibu. Uh, we will share after this one shortly. We'll send by email. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Saya akan uh, through the the chat or through the email. Uh, I will send via email now. I'm just uh, opening my email to Ibu Marta. 
Okay. So, um, yeah, I will share later. Is it okay, uh, Bu, Bu Chris? I will share uh, okay. later the email. You can, uh, yes, can. You can share uh, in WhatsApp group uh, at, at yeah. uh, Master Program of Public Health uh, Administrator. Okay. 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 Uh, so, Don Marie, everyone can get, uh, have uh, the presentation from Riz and Jericho today. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we just can make a conclusion of uh, this meeting such a uh, systematic review question and answer. Uh, so, uh, the systematic review. <laughs> kita uh, melakukan untuk apa tadi uh, kita step-stepnya yang sudah dilak yang harus dilakukan adalah merencanakan yang kemudian membuat pertanyaan penelitian kemudian membuat kriteria inklusi dan eksklusi kemudian kita melakukan screening ya. uh, dan eligibility-nya dari uh, paper yang akan kita pilih kemudian melakukan data extraction ya kemudian melakukan quality assessment Ya, kemudian menganalisis dan mensintesis dan kemudian menulisnya kembali. Kemudian dari beberapa pertanyaan ada pertanyaan apakah kita memerlukan conceptual framework? Ya, kita memerlukan conceptual framework tentu saja untuk menjawab ya, membuat membuat hipotesis ya, membuat hipotesis kemudian melaksanakannya, menjawab pertanyaan tersebut tentu saja kita membutuhkan conceptual framework. Uh, jadi hipotesis itu bi bisa di, uh, diwujudkan juga di, uh, bahkan di, di tujuan maupun di pertanyaan perna, uh, pertanyaan penelitian. Kemudian ada pertanyaan apakah kita membutuhkan ethical clearance? Uh, ethical clearance tidak kita butuhkan, tetapi uh, kita harus uh, memikirkan juga tentang implikasi uh, atau menerapkan juga prinsip-prinsip uh, etik ya di dalam publikasi tersebut apakah publikasi tersebut tadi juga artikel-artikel uh, uh, yang kita ambil apakah itu juga uh, memenuhi uh, uh, ethical clearance dan juga implikasi dari uh, implikasi dari uh, systematic review yang kita tulis itu harus juga memenuhi uh, sistem atau prinsip-prinsip etik Kemudian berapa sih uh, waktunya yang kira-kira dibutuhkan untuk membuat suatu uh, systematic review? Kira-kira butuh waktu satu setengah tahun. Ya, jadi uh, kemudian faktor-faktor apa yang penting? Yang penting adalah faktor the composition of the team. Ya, siapa sih yang yang bekerja di dalam tim itu? Kemudian bagaimana kita mengkontak uh, <tuh> kontak sumber-sumber uh, uh, nak artikel tersebut penulisnya kemudian maintaining the commitment ya, memelihara komitmen dari penulis ini kemudian juga bisa menggunakan software tadi Ryan yang tadi sudah disampaikan ya kemudian juga juga lalu bagaimana membuat ini menarik ya membuat membuat tulisan kita menarik uh, untuk dipublikasi ya uh, membuat uh, introduction itu bagaimana oh ya sorry ini membuat introduction itu bagaimana jadi jangan menuliskan uh, jangan mensitasi artikel-artikel tersebut artikel-artikal yang kita review itu jangan disitasi di introduction ya tapi kita buat diluaskan uh, approachnya ada pendekatannya diluaskan pertanyaannya sehingga kita tanpa menyebut artikel-artikel yang kita uh, sitasi tersebut, artikel-artikel yang kita review, kita juga bisa membuat introduction yang baik. Dan juga uh, bagaimana kalau ada perubahan di dalam proses, ya di dalam proses kita bisa uh, menambahkan artikel atau kriteria tambahan yang mau kita inginkan di dalam proses itu. Lalu bagaimana caranya dengan menggunakan citation changing, changing ya jadi uh, itu bisa dilakukan uh, at any stage kapan saja kita lakukan ya kemudian kita bisa menambahkan di situ ya prosedurnya bahwa kita menambahkan uh, sesuatu prosedur yang berbeda atau artikel yang berbeda menambahkan lagi artikelnya kemudian diskusinya bagaimana menarik 
ya bagaimana supaya menarik supaya bisa di, uh, diterbitkan ya kita memilih juga target jurnalnya supaya for, for, fokusnya itu sama ya dengan uh, tar, uh, fokus dari artikel kita kemudian uh, ada awal itu remind the reader apa tujuannya kemudian isi discussion ya uh, pertama meng, mengingatkan kembali dari uh, pembaca apa tujuannya kemudian uh, menulis dari yang paling signifikan temuan yang paling signifikan sampai yang paling tidak signifikan Kemudian di conclusion kita menulis lagi kembali ke tujuan penelitian, menjawab dari pertanyaan penelitian. Ya saya rasa itu yang bisa kita ringkaskan dan uh, semoga ini semuanya uh, mendapatkan uh, berguna, ya bermanfaat dan menyemangati kita semua uh, untuk melakukan systematic review. Ya. Terima kasih, thank you for you Riz and Jericho, thank you very much. For uh, your availability for this program, uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate your effort and time. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, untuk semua peserta, kami juga mengucapkan terima kasih atas kehadirannya. Semoga semua ini bermanfaat. Anda menulis dengan baik, ya. Yeah. Uh, dan, <coughs> ya, yeah. maaf mungkin uh, Chris sudah. Live ya karena ada ya, live dan saya juga ya. mau mohon izin uh, karena ada dentist appointment. Ya. <laughs> The next 15 minutes. Ya. <laughs> nah, saya terlambat ya. ya. Terima kasih Oke, semuanya. Terima, terima kasih, terima kasih Mas Jericho. Ya, ya, ya. Marta. Ya, Pak Farid minta tolong uh, foto yang terakhir Pak Farid. Ya. Terima kasih Bu Marta. Ya. Bapak Ibu silakan dibuka. Official. <laughs> We have to. Ya sama Seriko untuk laporan. Laporan, ayo Bu Lintang silakan yang lainnya silakan. bergabung. Silakan uh, melihat kamera, oke. Okay. Satu, dua, tiga. Sekali lagi untuk yang halaman kedua. Saya eh, sudah bisa izin ya, Pak. Kita terima ya. kasih Mas Jericho. Terima kasih Mas Jericho. Terima kasih. Salam untuk keluarga ya. Terima kasih Bu. Oke, terima kasih untuk yang halaman kedua. Sekarang halaman ketiga. Ini ada empat halaman luar biasa sekali. Siang ini ya. yang hadir sekitar 119 orang. Oh. Ya, pertemuan siang ini. Alhamdulillah, terima kasih Mas, untuk semua peserta. Thank you. Terima kasih, mohon maaf kalau banyak kekurangan. Sudah selesai, mohon izin Mantap. Pak. Ya, ya makasih Kuyuli. Ya, Teman-teman yang lain ini, makasih untuk ya, kami. Izin live, live ya. Sudah Halo. Pak Farid, have you finish your click click? Untuk Uh, fotonya ya. sudah selesai, Bapak Ibu sekalian. Apabila menginginkan uh, materi-materi tadi, Bapak Ibu yang di luar FKM Undip bisa menengok ke website kami, website. Yeah. FKM, Magister Kesehatan Masyarakat Undip. Di sana akan kami posting materi-materi yang disampaikan oleh uh, pemateri siang hari ini. Ya. Baik, Bapak Ibu, monggo Bu Gres dibuat tutup. Okay. Ya, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua uh, Terima kasih tentu saja kepada Rich Jericho Ini teman lama saya <laughs> Berapa tahun yang lalu Yang masih bersambung sampai sekarang Di tengah kesibukan beliau Karena uh, saya berapa kali menghubungi teman yang lain Maria Farok, ya, Bung Marta ya, Maria juga tidak tidak bersedia untuk memberikan kuliah walaupun dia daring karena kondisi perguruan tinggi di Australia saat ini memang sebagian dihadapkan pada masalah di tengah pandemi COVID harus melakukan efisiensi sementara international class mereka turun tajam dan sebagainya kita tahu bahwa pengelolaan perguruan tinggi di luar negeri itu sangat mengandalkan efisiensi sehingga mereka dikebut untuk kejar target dan sebagainya kami bisa memahami, semoga lain waktu Farouk dan 
Maria Agaliotis bisa bergabung di dalam kuliah kita. Uh, terima kasih kepada tentu saja tadi pemateri yang sudah live karena memang 11 o'clock mereka harus apa ada kegiatan yang tidak bisa ditinggalkan. Terima kasih Rizin Cliff dan Jericho Pardosi. Kemudian Bu Marta, terima kasih yang sudah bertugas sebagai moderator, Pak Farid dan tim yang sudah mengurus segala sesuatunya. Dan tentu saja kepada rekan dosen ini yang sudah setia sampai akhir. Mas Yudi yang jauh dari Amsterdam, kemudian Bu Yuliani, Bu Lintang. Tadi Mbak, khusus pesan untuk Mbak Rebecca. Harus segera menyelesaikan proposalnya supaya bisa sebenarnya proposal. Karena Anda merupakan mahasiswa pertama dari Magister Kesmas yang yang akan memakai uh, systematic review untuk tesis. Uh, thanks for Ahmed, Ahmed Abusov, and uh, uh, Ahmed. Yes, okay. let's go. Yes, Ahmed yes. and Khaled, Khaled Sefeldin. Thank you. Thank you. Dan juga untuk, yes, dan juga untuk um, peserta yang lain. Ya, Terima kasih sudah hadir. Mohon maaf bila ada kekurangan-kekurangan. Nah, semoga materi yang diberikan ini bisa meningkatkan gairah kita untuk mencoba melakukan penelitian lain, yaitu dengan metode systematic review yang sangat populer di luar negeri, tetapi di Indonesia baru dilirik sebagai suatu metode yang menarik untuk dipakai mungkin baru beberapa tahun terakhir. Kendalanya salah satunya adalah sebenarnya mudah sih, satu tadi pertanyaannya Bu Yuliani sulit untuk memperoleh memperlu jurnal internasional akses agak terbatas sementara di Indonesia untuk melakukan penelitian dengan uh, data primer itu sebenarnya apalagi public health juga cukup murah kendalanya juga sebenarnya nggak terlalu berat apalagi kalau kita meneliti di institusi-institusi uh, pemerintah jadi memang ada kewajiban mereka untuk uh, untuk uh, terbuka di dalam memberikan data kepada masyarakat. Ini yang mungkin menjadi tantangan kita, selain tantangan kesibukan yang lain, kesibukan yang luar biasa untuk kegiatan yang aneka macam, karena untuk melakukan systematic review ini butuh benar-benar komitmen, keep in touch terus-terusan ya untuk, untuk menyelesaikan itu. Menyelesaikan studi ini sampai selesai, kemudian langkah berikutnya sampai publish. Gitu. Demikian dari saya, Terima kasih sekali lagi. Semoga bermanfaat dan kita jumpa pada perkuliahan lewat webinar dengan dosen tamu yang lain. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Sehat selalu. Sehat selalu. Sehat selalu. Semuanya Bapak-Ibu. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Ya. Ya. Salam sehat, penuh semangat. Ya. Selamat ulang tahun, Bu Lintang. Oh iya. Ya. Happy birthday. Kuenya mana, Bu Lintang? Kuenya, kue, kue. Kuenya di Baik, Bapak Ibu, mohon izin. Oke. Okay. Selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.